Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Now, we have been moving fairly slowly here, and I just want to, before we start, before we have prayer, just want to mention that um, uh, what we're trying to do here is take these lines in the book of Judges and get them ready so that I can have them for my notes uh, for the camp meeting. And so we really need to understand what it is we're doing. And so, so that's why we've been taking a lot of time for so for those watching these studies. I know it might seem a little tedious, but this is the process that we go through um, to understand God's word. But before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful once again to be able to open your word together to break the bread of life, and to receive instruction and nourishment from you. We are thankful, Lord, for uh, the light that you have given us and for the trials that uh, understanding truth brings. Because we know, Lord, that, that the purpose is to develop in us a Christ-like character. And we just ask that we can learn as we go through these trials to trust in you. We pray for your angels care and protection. We pray for one another. And we ask Lord that as we look at the book of Judges again, that you can provide us with light and information that we can share with others. We ask that these truths will change us and work uh, a change in those around us as well. Be with us now, we pray and ask through thy spirit and in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again, and um, <clears throat> we're going to be dealing with, not Gideon, but with, uh, so we change that there, uh, with Abimelech's conspiracy, and what we had done is we had tried to find, and to me it was kind of like pulling teeth to get you guys to help me with this. Sorry about that, but, but that's just the way it seemed. Um, so what we have, and this is just really quick review. We know that Judges goes from 9-11 to 2023. And the, the judge that we are looking at here is not one of the particular waymarks. That is, this is Jotham. And Jotham is Samuel Snow's letters. Right. And so we have Jotham and along with Jotham is this prophecy of Abimelech's downfall. So Abimelech is neither a judge. He's not he's not on the judge's line at, at all as a line. Um, Jotham is representing Samuel Snow, as we said. And so here we have Jotham's line and Abimelech's downfall. Those are the two lines that we get from Judges 9. Now, we have put these two lines back to back, even though they go on top of each other, chronologically speaking, uh, Jotham's line is this light that has come to this movement. Uh, basically, this line, these two lines together, is the 777 uh, prophetic mirror or chiasm. It's uh, 32,901 days in length from December 21st, 2012 to December 25th, 2021. It uh, relates to uh, the year of the flood, the 2391 BC, right? So even though those two are reversed, the three and the two, we, we've related it to that. And that relates, of course, to um, the flood has to deal with the story of Lamech and, of course, uh, all of that chronology of the patriarchs leading up to the flood. And then we have um, symbols that occur in these verses. So when we put the two verses together, I didn't put all the verses there. I'm going to eventually uh, take everything that we're writing in here and put it in that line. Um, but when we go to Jotham's line, where we really have struggled, we can see the logic of this, this darkness, this, 
This is regarding the information, the way of studying that's going to lead to Parminder's time setting. That's the darkness. That's going to be in 2012. Now, through that period of darkness, we have these messages relating to chronology. And unintentionally on my part, but intentionally on God's part, he's revealing light to this movement. Um, and often in, in the studies that I'm presenting, though not necessarily, um, uh, there's other light that's coming through other sources, but a lot of it has to do with the information uh, that I'm unfolding, that is the symbols, right? The 264, the 391.5, the 187, uh, the 273 is not particularly something that I introduce to the movement, but I definitely develop it in connection with um, uh, the Mayan calendar, right? And so that's going to bring us all up to November 9th, and that 273 that's presented on November 9th. So all of these truths that are being revealed in this period of time, this seven years, is um, going to be involved in its... So we develop these symbols, but they're going to be played out in Abimelech's downfall. That is, we're going to see these symbols April 26th, July 18th, March 27th, um, all of these symbols are going to be attached to Abimelech's downfall. The 391.5, of course, is going to be applied in confirming the starting date of the 777 chiasm. So, so this becomes extremely um, you know, important in understanding in how these things are connected. So this line here is the primary line that's in... Judges chapter 9. It's about Abimelech's downfall, but it's also about Jotham. And so Jotham has this parable, and we have the, all of the fig and the vine, and those are fulfilled in that, in Abimelech's downfall. So the problem is when we do Jotham's line, it's hard to find the actual verses that we would use to say, well, this verse goes to this way mark. So I personally think that we have to abandon that approach for this line. It is, there's too much about this line um, that is, um, that it, 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 it sort of covers so many different aspects of Judges chapter 9. So, so I'm going to argue, and maybe you agree with me, maybe you disagree. But I think with Jotham's line, we're not going to be able to do what we had been doing, that is taking a verse and lining it up with a way mark. What we can say is that the first message that's in this line, if, if we look at this line as the first angel's message, arriving, formalization, and empowerment, these are going to relate to the truths that are connected with the 26th day of the fourth month. Okay, so, and, and we were looking, uh, yesterday we were looking at this start of the Mayan calendar. So I'm going to bring you back to this point. So we're going to look at this first angel's message in Jotham's line. We could see that we have this 26th day of the fourth month symbol there. And, and then we're going to see that this next part of this line is going to deal with these other symbols. So we'll, we'll see how, how we do that. So what I would do, instead of saying that, um, like, this is, okay, well, we'll go back first. I'm trying to jump ahead. I'm trying to do too many things. So let's just go back to this Mayan calendar. <clears throat> okay, so... So the Mayan calendar, we know if we 13000. So I'm going to just make this a bit bigger so people can see this. So 
So you can see this Mayan calendar date. This is December 21st, 2012. That's where the line of Jotham begins. Now, if we go back, um, what I'll do is I'll do it this way. I'm going to adjust this. I'm going to go 1,872,000 days earlier. And that will bring me back to August 11th, 3113 BC on the Gregorian calendar. So if you see that there, you can see this Gregorian date. And that's going to be the 10th day of the fifth month. Okay. So it's the 10th day of the fifth month. The mine date is 0000. Okay. Now, originally, so that is when the mine calendar starts. Now, it has the symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. The 10th day of the fifth month, of course, we know, is from the book of Ezekiel. It's going to be the date that the temple is destroyed. Ezekiel is going to begin uh, prophesying on the, uh, the fifth day of the fourth month, but he's going to be predicting an event that happens on the tenth day of the fifth month. His third vision is going to occur on the tenth day of the fifth month, and he's going to be predicting the siege and destruction of Jerusalem, not just in 586 BC, but also in 70 AD, 666th year from Jehoiachin's captivity. Now, the August 11th date, the reason why that caught my attention, obviously, when I was looking at the Mayan calendar and he said it was August 11th that the Mayan calendar starts, that was just the first clue that hmm, this Mayan calendar might be interesting. When I looked at the date and I saw, when I originally did this, I didn't look at this date. That is, I didn't, I didn't look at August 11th, 3113, because you see the Gregorian date and you see the Julian date below it. He believed, the guy who wrote this paper, um, I know his last name's Herman, but uh, uh, when he wrote this paper, he just assumed, like I would assume, that if you have a date in, in the past, that you're going to use the Julian date. But the source that he gave had given the Gregorian date. And the Gregorian date, they have a zero year between BC and AD, and that's why it's one year difference. So what I had originally looked up was um, uh, it would be, th what, 340 days? Yeah. So I looked at um, August 11th, 3113 BC, Julian. Now, you can see that it, it says Tammuz 25 there, but it's mm -hmm. actually the 26th day of the fourth month if you do the calendar correctly. That is, you have to observe each month. You can't start back then. You don't have 30 and 29, 30 and 29. You observe the new moons. We didn't get the biblical calendar to do that prior to 1533. So sometimes I have to go and check it out. But it's actually going to be the 26th day of the fourth month. And so when I when I originally did the work and I looked at it, I saw that August 11th, 3113 was the 26th day of the fourth month. So even though it's the 10th day of the fifth month, if we go to the actual start of that date, when we, um, when I first looked at it, I looked at August 11th, 3113 BC, where it's really August 11th, Gregorian 3113 BC, which would be 3114 BC, which would be September 6th. 3114 BC, if we use the Julian date, right? So hopefully that doesn't confuse people. But the point is, this 26th day of the fourth month symbol occurs in connection with my discovery of the Mayan calendar, right? So what I should put down here is August 11th, 3113 BC, is this um, 26th day of the fourth month. But August 11, and this one I would use the minus sign. Oops. Is the 10th day of the fifth month. So... So this information from the Mayan calendar, this I first discover 
um, early in November of uh, 2018. So after we had uh, discovered both of these dates, the 26th day of the fourth month and the 10th day of the fifth month, obviously we have to have those two with July 18th. It's not until I have those two symbols that I find this on the mind calendar and I present it at Lambert Church. I can't remember if it's like November 5th or something like that, November 8th. I can't remember whatever the first Sabbath in November of 2018 was. That's when I presented this, that the Mayan calendar had significance, right? Now, um, so then when we, and, and we're placing that as 2013. So we're using the, the start of the year there uh, um, being the, the solstice, the, the winter solstice, rather than uh, December 31st or January 1st. <clears throat> so that's technically uh, 2013. So that's going to be discovered at the beginning of this line. And then we have a period of seven years going all the way to November 9th, 2019. Now we know if we count that extra week of probation, probation it's 25, 20 days to November 15th, 2019, which we have in the other line. So this becomes very significant. The symbols that are here are the 26th day of the fourth month and the 10th day of the fifth month. So when we get to uh, um, you know, so when we get to this this history at the end, we're going to be discovering these um, these truths with the empowerment of the second angel's message. That is, all of these things, all of these symbols that are developing in Jotham's line, they're going to be understood or brought together on October thirteenth, two thousand eighteen. Right. So during this time, they're developing, they're brought together with the empowerment of the second angel. And then when the third angel arrives, that's going to be Parminder's downfall or the Abimelech's downfall. But the message of Parminder that had continued into this movement. So the things that he was teaching about time setting are being undone in our movement. So if we think about this, if we, we try to, to understand what happened. Here's how I understand this. Ellen White's counsel regarding time setting still stands. Parminder is going to try to set that aside. He's going to make an argument, this dispensational argument, um, that the reason that we can time set is because Ellen White's counsel doesn't apply in our dispensation. The danger of that is... If that's true regarding time setting, it's true regarding everything she said, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be dress reform, health reform, uh, the Sunday law, all these things. But he's going to try to sneak this into the movement through this time setting. Now, now Jeff is going to accept this because um, Jeff is going to be deceived, right? This, this happens. Um, you know, so we, we we could try to blame Jeff and put the blame on him, you know, that somehow he he allowed this in. But but it's really part of the line. OK, so so I'm saying that these verses, we, we have some verses marked there. But really, this whole message of Jotham's line is is about these symbols. Now, the main symbol. That we have is the 70 sons of Gideon or uh, um, uh, Jeroboam, right? And and the symbol that comes from that is the symbol of Lamech, right? Because Lamech, he's going to live for seven hundred and seventy-seven years, but he has tied to him. Um, you know, Enoch is born sixty-five years later. He's going to have Methuselah, and 187 years after that, Lamech is going to be born. And Lamech is, of course, going to be the father of Noah. And we have the 65 and the 187, or 252, followed by 777 years of Lamech's life. There are two Lamechs, the Lamech who's the descendant of Cain, who is the 70 times 7, 
curse attached to him for manslaughter, that he, at least he requests, requests of God that, that the curse be uh, brought up on 70 times 7 to somebody who would seek revenge for this accidental death because Cain committed murder and he has a seven times curse put upon anyone who would seek revenge. So, so we have this symbol of Lamech, and Lamech is then the 777 and the 70 times 7. And so we tie Lamech because his name, um, if you take the letters in English and you multiply them, the gematria, you get 18720, right? And we know that this Mayan calendar date is 1,872,000 days from the start of the Mayan calendar. So all of these symbols come together here in this Mayan date that starts this period of time. Now, when we take the formalization of this, um, we're using Ezra 7.9. So what Ezra 7.9 does to this, because at this point, we have a time of the end. And then we have an increase of knowledge, right? So on December 21st, 2012, we don't have anything particular happen in the movement. I meet my wife, Heidi, which gives me time to study. So there's a practical uh, thing. So once I marry Heidi, I have lots more time uh, to study than I had when I was working 75 hours a week, going down to 15 hours a week. That's why I can study. But we have this increase of knowledge. So even from October 5th to December 21st, the 77 days, I begin presenting the 2520 chiasm at that camp meeting on October 5th. And, um, and that's going to actually lead to me uh, meeting Heidi because I'm presenting that 2520 and people hear about this and they invite me to a Bible study. I start leading out in this Bible study on the 2520 and Heidi is invited to this Bible study by somebody who's going there. So it's kind of an interesting story in that in that context of how things unfold. So when we get to de December 21st, 2012, we don't have any particular thing in the movement happening, but we have an we have a time of the end. So that's the time of the end, the end of that time prediction that the world is going to end. So a time prediction that the world's going to end on December 21st, 2012 is a time of the end, right? Now, nothing happens. It's a failed prediction. But we're studying, right? And light is going to come to this movement. In 2013, on August 31st, 2013, and, and that date has some similarities to the 3113 BC. That's why we have it there. And the August date <clears throat> of August 11th. So... We, we In August 3rd, 31st, Jeff asked the question about es, Ezra 7-9. Now, I'm going to answer it on that date as well. I'm going to do the calculation, which then, a year later, on June 22nd at that camp meeting, the Jeff marks, right, and he marks it as three years from when he receives this $165,000. $165,000 is... 264 times 624 plus 264. So this Ezra 7 9 symbol is explained at this camp meeting. And we know that halfway between June 22nd, 2011 and June 22nd, 2014 is December 21st, 2012. So it presents this chiasm. It presents this symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month. Right? So we can see that that camp meeting is the formalization of this message. And what is revealed in that increase of knowledge, right, in 2013 to 2014 is then formalized at this camp meeting. And then what we have is we have the next year. Now, the date that we put there is the release of Ellen White's writings on um, July 16th. It's the centennial of... Uh, Ellen White's um, death, and it's the release of these manuscripts. And the main thing that seems to be noticed there is these statements regarding what's going to happen at Nashville. Now, it was known before 
that she had a vision at Nashville and that it talks about a destruction of a city. But most people hadn't attached that to this occurring at Nashville. But there she clearly shows that it's at Nashville that this destruction happens. So this is a destruction upon Nashville. Now, our movement doesn't really pick up on this until 2019 um, when Odilia asked me about it. And I said, well, where is this attack going to happen? It's going to be Nashville. Now, we know in 2015 um, at that camp meeting, Jeff is going to bring up about this prediction. Well, maybe I bring it up, but I ask about, you know, this prediction, we're going to be making a prediction. And he says, well, Mark Bruce is working on that. He thinks he's going to come up with the answer. Um, and, you know, I end up being the one who develops that uh, July 18th, the date. And this becomes, you know, a major part of the movement. But at the time, I'm just interested in what's going to happen, just like anybody in the movement would be. No idea the part that I'm going to have to play. Now we all, so that's get camp meeting is going to be from the 17th to whatever it is, the 25th or something like that. But um, I put July 16th to 22nd because it's going to be the 20, 20th, the 21st, and the 22nd that I do these three presentations on Revelation 9. And so that's why I put the 26th day of the fourth month there, because it's in Revelation 9 that I first present the 26th day of the fourth month. Now, specifically, in 1299 and in 1840, I recognize the 26th day of the fourth month. The first is Julian, the second is Gregorian. Those are both July 27th. When I look at the 26th day of the fourth month, um, in, uh, uh, in um, uh, 1449, so that's at the end of the 150 years, what I notice is the 26th day of the fourth month is July 18th, Julian, right? And of course, that doesn't mean anything to me. Or, or pardon me, uh, July, yeah, Julian. But it's the Gregorian date that I, I notice later when I, when I do this study. That is the Gregorian date is July 27th is the 26th day of the fourth month. So I wasn't just the program that I had, which was only giving Julian dates. I hadn't done the conversion, but we have July 18th there as well. So, um, so that's just something that that was 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 there in doing this calculation. But I didn't. It didn't mean anything to me. July 18th didn't mean anything. So, so that is in 1449, the 26th day of the fourth month is July 18th, Julian, and July 27th, Gregorian. So those three symbols all come together there, the 26th day of the fourth month, July 27th, and July 18th. But it's not seen as significant by me in 2015, not until we get to 2018. So this is all the first angel's message. And... It's all tied to these verses. Um, you know, we we could try to, you know, find something in verse six that fits there. But I would just say we could just do this if we really wanted to. Um, we'll do this. So what we have is the 70. Uh, so we got judges. What am I doing here? We got nine verse four. Right. So that's what we're going to say. I'm going to do it this way. Now, we also have the same symbol here. It's just going to be the death. So we'll put nine verse five. We could say uh, the hiring of uh, take this way. Nine verse five. So I'd kind of put those two together there, but I'm going to I'm going to put them both here. And what's the symbol here is the 70. Right. That that's really what ma matters is the 70. So we're going to have the hiring of. So let's just look at these verses again. And hopefully people are happy with what I'm doing. So, you know, uh, you're not, you're not, if you have th thoughts on this, that's great because I want to hear them. But 
So nine verse four was first the hiring of those 70 of, of the vain and light persons with the 70 uh, pieces of silver to, uh, to kill the 70 sons, right? And then in nine verse five, they're going to do that. So we could say nine verse four is the formalization. Nine verse five is the empowerment. So how this ties us to these dates and these symbols is simply through the 70. And the 70 gives us this week of Christ, the 70 weeks, and the 70 weeks ties us back to Lamech. And Lamech ties us to this first angel's message in this line. So hopefully that's clear. If it's not clear to people, ask the questions. If it is clear, uh, always take your silence as that you're in agreement. Okay, so that's how I solved this problem. I'm just saying that this is all about this first message is all about this symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month, which you have to accept this message if you're going to accept the second message. Now, we know that this is just light that's coming to us that's going to be worked out in this 777 days. So now when we go to um, 9 verse 6, so if we're going to say 9 verse 6, and all the men of Shechem gathered together and all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And when they told it, Jotham, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up up his voice and cried and said unto them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth to in time, on a time, to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. Now we're going to say that this parable is worked out in this period of time here, that is the 777 days. So the olive, the fig, and the vine are messages relating to these dates, November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th. Those are the four Sabbaths or the three Sabbaths that mark this uh, particular period of time. They're the primary way marks in this line, dividing it into 252 and 525. And um, so... So this is the message that, that we're, we're giving, right, in this period of time, this 777 days. Now, this construction where you have three, those dates, those um, dates that we have here, November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th, are in a 777 structure with them being Sabbaths. And with July 18th being the 26th day of the fourth month on both the biblical and uh, the rabbinic calendar never has occurred in history except in this period of time. Right. So this is something that's unique. You can't go back and find these three dates being all Sabbaths with the 26th day, of the fourth month being July 18th. Right. Just doesn't occur. So this is a unique event. Just as the September 23rd, 2017 uh, arrangement of the stars with the sun and the moon, uh, the sun clothing uh, Virgo, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars above her head, never has occurred in history until September 23rd, 2017. So we have these very unique astronomical, and even though it's a calendar, it's in a sense an astronomical event. It's based upon observations of the sky, why we have calendars in the first place. Um, so, so all of these things, um, all of these symbols come together in this period of time, in our, our history. But they are connected with a failed prediction. So one of the things that we haven't really considered too much, we know that Parminder's prediction fails. So it's on a line of failed predictions. 
That's one of the things I presented to Jeff on April 26th, um, uh, 20, uh, 2020, when I gave him that email. I said November 9th is a failed prediction, September 23rd, 2017 is a failed prediction, and the mind dates is a failed prediction. We have a pagan failed prediction, we have a Protestant, and then we have one that's in our movement. Those are all on that line. And so July 18th could be a failed prediction. That's my suggestion. We should consider this, that maybe that this is the case, right? Now, if we think about this being Abimelech's downfall, Parminder has used time incorrectly. He's using the Protestant uh, ideology, that of dispensationalism, to predict time. Now, to some degree, our movement had adopted that. In spite of what I tried to say about time, that we couldn't use the dispensational argument, that we have to accept Ellen White's statements regarding time, that's largely ignored by people in the movement. That is, people still make the same argument that Parminder made. And they believe that we can predict events, which I'm arguing that we can't. We can't predict the date of events. We can look at time, we can measure it, but this time is standing as a witness against Parminder's time setting. That is, in a sense, what we see with all these dates that God has given us is evidence that we cannot set time. Right? That we can't predict events in the future. Now, the question is, why does God do that? Why does God give, use time to show us that we can't predict events? Shouldn't we just accept Ellen White's statements, right? That's the way people in Adventism would say. They say, well, Ellen White says we can't set time. You guys are setting time. So you guys are the ones in error. And, and we're not going to look at any of your time that you have, any of these dates, because we just know it's error. And, and you didn't have to go through this whole thing to know that time was wrong. But we did, right? Because time was introduced into this movement with a false argument that is apostasy does occur. Now, we also know that if we look at the arguments that are being used against time setting, what are some of the verses that people would use from scripture to say that we can't set dates, we can't know the time of the second coming and all those types of things. What would they use from scripture? What are the verses? One of the chief, one of the chief ones is, that it is, I think it's Matthew 24, 36 or something. And no man knoweth the day or the hour or Christ appearing. It, and it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which God has put in his own power, right? Right? No man knows the day of the hour. Those are the two primary statements, right? Now, would that have also applied to the Millerites? Well, yes, God's word is for all time. Okay. So if for the Millerites, they're not supposed to know the day or the hour, right? Right? And and it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that God has put in his own power. Well, if we use those arguments, we would have to use them against the Millerites, right? But what they did was wrong. Right? Because Jesus isn't qualifying that and saying after October 22nd, 1844, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that God has put in his own power. It's not for you to know the day or the hour. He's not saying after that date. If we just take those statements as the way that they're used, we would have to argue any use of time to predict any event, even in Millerite history, would be wrong. But we know that God gave us these time prophecies. He gave us time. He gave us all of these symbols. So we can't make that argument 
in that way. So time does exist, but not in the way that we can predict these events. Ellen White's quite clear. We can't know the time of the outpouring of the latter rain, the close of probation, the second coming of Christ, or any promise of special significance. Right. So those promises, those things on the big line that Ellen White's talking about, the Sunday law, right? We can't know the day or the hour of the Sunday law. We can't know the precise time of those events. But that doesn't mean that time doesn't exist. Right. Because Millerite history is based upon time. So you can't use those arguments to say that you can't use time prophecies, right? We can, but those time prophecies occur for a reason and, and not because we are deciding to predict events. So one of the things about this whole history of what was revealed in that period of time from the Mayan calendar date all the way up to um, uh, November 9th, 2019, that first seven years there. What, what is happening is I'm simply studying the prophecies of the past. No intention of setting dates. So when we have this November 9th, 2019 date that Tess proposes, all I can do is witness that it's part of his structure, that it's 391 and a half days from October 13th when I do the measurement. And that is remarkable. And then everything falls into place. And, and what falls into place is we get this July 18th date, which Tess rejects. She even re rejects the 391 and a half days, right? But this is standing as a witness against the methodology of Parminder and Tess, and even the methodology that continues on in the movement. So we get to July 18th and our prediction fails. What do people do? They continue to try to get July 18th somehow to, to work, right? And, and, and with Odilio, he, he tries to fit the mandates in there, and he does so correctly. That is, those mandates fit into that it gives us these witnesses regarding and it gives us all these symbols that i, I later apply to um, um uh, collins prediction regarding trump i use those same symbols to show that this april 5th 2030 date which comes from the week of christ study is tied to collins studies right so these are remarkable things but all of these are standing as a witness against a certain methodology. But God has given us this information, right? He's given us these dates. He's gave us Odilio's study. He gave us Colin's study. But all of these were meant to show that we can't set dates. And if we continue to try to predict a time that some event is going to occur, we are in error. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, we have this April 5th, 2030 date. We have no idea what it means. But we do know that we can't predict that it's some particular event. We don't know if it's just even a symbolic date that just tries to show us something. It, it does show that we have a period of time, however long that is, for this movement to do its work. Maybe that's what's going to happen by the by that time, by 2030. This movement will have accomplished its task of warning Adventism. We don't know, right? But we can see here that that this message of Jotham that has to do with with all of these things, that is Samuel Snow's letters, uh, to me have always been the key to all of this. It is Samuel Snow's letter ties everything together. So Samuel Snow's letters tie everything together, right? Without his letters, 
We don't have July 18, 2020. Samuel Snow's letters. Without Samuel Snow's letters, we actually don't have an understanding of Ezekiel. Right? So all of these truths are all so interconnected. Um, I'm not sure that even I understand all of the interconnectedness, even though I've spent probably the most time studying all of this. Um, but we can see everything is interconnected. It's all purposeful. And it's to show us about time. And, and to say that God can't use time to show us that we can't do time setting and that it's just somehow an error that we made in setting time at all. And I think in some ways it is. I mean, Parminder's time setting is an error. It is an enemy that, right, because his is going to be Sisera. It's an enemy that was left in the land to try us, to test us, to prove us. And if we understand that, that the way that God corrects, corrects errors in our lives is to bring us through experiences for us to see the course of our action and the foolishness of it. But we also need to recognize that those who rejected the messages that we had given, that had been given to us, the messages of the 2520 and so forth, they're not without fault because... There is light that comes from Millerite history that has been unfolded as we've gone through this history. They're going to be, in, unless they receive the message regarding Millerite history, they're not going to be prepared for the Sunday law. So in order to be prepared for the Sunday law, God gives the first and second angels messages, right, to Adventism. They are repeated, and we're experiencing that presently. But all of Adventism has to experience those two messages, right? Maybe differently than we do, but they're still going to experience it. In some ways, we would have to argue that, that our line is simply typical of what's going to happen within Adventism. But we know 1989, that's the time of the end. The first angel's message arrives. And it arrives, you know, to Jeff. Right. Jeff is going to be the one that's chosen to present this message that we're repeating Millerite history. Even though there's other people who are recognizing that Daniel 11 uh, verse 40 B is fulfilled in 1989. People like me, I don't recognize it as the time of the end. I don't think there's two times of the end. I just say, oh, 40 A was fulfilled in 1798. And now we're in the time when 40 B is fulfilled. But I don't see the repeat of Millerite history. It's going to be Jeff that brings that out, right? So when I come to this movement in 2010, I already have a lot of knowledge about these things. I'm not coming in sort of cold. I understand uh, Daniel 11, verse 40. But I come in on basically the 2520 is the first thing that interests me. Um, but I slowly get to understand these lines. Uh, the point is, we have after 9-11, we have a second message, right? So the first message is going to be what Jeff is talking about, that repeat of Millerite history. But after 9-11, we're going to have a second message. So we can see here that all of that pattern, when we zoom into this waymark, this waymark is, as you can see in the judges line, it's not one of the waymarks, Right? And we know the judges itself isn't one of the waymarks on the big line. And in some ways, the judges is itself um, something like Jotham. And, and probably that's what we should do. So I'm just going to show you what I mean. So here we have this uh, somewhere here. We have judges line. Do I have the big line here somewhere? Maybe I didn't even put the big line. I thought I should have. This is just uh, the paper for the judges lines, but I probably need that big line somewhere. 
There's lots of stuff. Okay, so I didn't even put it in this paper, which I should. So I'm going to put it in here. I'm just hang on a sec. Um, Sorry about that. So this was a line we called um, the cosmic line, right? So. I'm just going to put this in here. Sec. Okay, so there's the cosmic line, right? So we can see in the cosmic line, we have um, all of these these things. So we've got the cosmic line, and the other line that we need is the line of literal Israel. So I guess that I probably should have just got both of those lines. Um, so here, I'll do it this way. I'll just take this whole slide. So get rid of this. Uh, Okay, so what we have here is we have the cosmic line, and I have the Canaan line here too. I'm going to need this for my notes. And then we have literal Israel. So in literal Israel, we're going to have these different way marks. But in this line here, we don't have the period of the judges, right? We got Egypt, to Israel's 12 sons, Egypt to Canaan, 1097. Right, so judges would be somewhere in here, right? It's going to be before 1097, and over here. So, so we somehow have to figure out how these lines work. <laughs> but what we do know is it's not. I say that the judges is a part of a progressive destruction of four, right? So, once they get to Canaan, there's a a generation in here, uh, the first second, third, and fourth generation. And then you have another reform line. So in between uh, the death of, of Joshua and the anointing of Saul is where the period of the judges is, right? And that's a progressive destruction of four. So it's, it's not really even a reform line, right? Other than that, a progressive destruction of four can be a reform line. So... Um, so that's what we're addressing here. So hopefully that, that's making sense to people, that we're, that's where we are. This judge's line, this whole judge's line, it is something that occurs within literal Israel's line, but it occurs within literal Israel's line as progressive destruction of four. And, and we might revive some of, revise some of these lines. We might change how we, we structured them. But that's how we had done it before. Um, now, so we have here Jotham. Jotham is not a waymark, right? It's just Samuel Snow's letters. But so also is Abimelech's downfall. And we can see that Abimelech's downfall technically is going to go from 11.9, where Gideon's line is, all the way to December 25th, 2021. Now, that is, if we look at Millerite history, this way, Mark, the, formal, the empowerment of the first message uh, in Millerite history is August 11th, 1840, right? This way, Mark, here is the first disappointment. December 6th, lines up with the formalization of the message, which is midnight, Samuel Snow at midnight. 
And December 25th, 2021 lines up with the second angel being empowered, that is the midnight cry. And January 11th becomes the third angel's message arriving. You can see these are all these different judges. So, so this from the first angel being empowered to the second angel being empowered is this story of Abimelech's downfall. And we can see how that relates to the Protestants. Because the Protestants' downfall occurs in that time. Now we can say the probation closes on July 18th, right? But still, there are things that continue within uh, the Millerite history that's going to show that when you get to October 22nd, 1844 here, which is January 11th, 23rd, 2023, that not everybody continues. So even though you have the Protestants being tested and then the Millerites, those Millerites that fail really are the ones that never accepted this whole message to begin with. So you're going to have 50 at the end. And we can say the, see the same thing if we apply it now to our history. If we apply it to our history and we see that this is um, November 9th, right? November 9th is this group that's being tested. It's this empowerment. And then you're going to see people falling away at July 18th. But people are still going to continue in the message. Some will fall away December 6th. Some fall away December 25th, 2021. But when we get to January 11th, 2023, we now have this new message. Right? So this is, in a sense, a close of probation. Now, it's difficult sort of to take this line in this way, because if we take the line in this way and we look at this as our history, judge's line, we know that when we get to the end of Colin's prediction, that people should have abandoned this prediction regarding Trump. But we still have people in the movement holding on to this. Now, those are people that accept July 18th. So we have people in this movement that accept um, this message, right? They they accept to some degree, you know, the, the rejection of this declaration, even though they're following some of its principles, and, and that when they come to December 25th, 2021, they might recognize that this date is part of our structure. Uh, but the point is that um, this movement in 2023 must become united. Now, we have this camp meeting coming up. We, we have that camp meeting in other lines, right, in the story of Samson. And, and so we see that, that this history, this camp meeting that's coming up, this isn't something that people could just lightly, according to these lines, could lightly just set aside and say, well, I don't want to go to that camp meeting. I really believe that this camp meeting is a test. Because the lines tell us that it is, right? Not because I set up the camp meeting and I want to test people. Because we can recognize that everything that we have done in our study and in the approach that we've taken has been according to the counsels in the spirit of prophecy, right? We have not done this out of any kind of spite or personal feelings. Everything that has happened is just being revealed to us from the study of the scriptures. Isn't it quite to the contrary? We're trying to unite? Right, yeah. So none of this was meant to uh, separate from our brethren. But we have to admit that the brethren are not interested, generally speaking, in the light that's coming from God's word. And that can seem pretty harsh, but it's just a reality, right? And, and they're not having bringing any light to this movement other than Collins and Odilio's two studies, the initial studies. There was light given, but they disregarded the light. Can we see that? I, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. I'm just trying to state the reality. Light was given. Colin did a presentation on December 25th, 2021. And there was light there. 
but they were unwilling to examine it. Right? They were just interested in the conclusion that Colin had without recognizing the light that had been given. And, and the reason they couldn't recognize the light that had been given is because they didn't want to place it with the other studies. So we had all of these other studies showing us this is light. Because if we hadn't done all the other studies, if we hadn't examined the foundation, we wouldn't have been able to recognize the light in Colin's presentation. But we were able to recognize it and say, this is something we need to study and, and examine together. Were they interested in studying and examining it together? All they wanted was Colin to present. We just let Colin present and, and have they just been letting Colin present ever since then, for the last year and a half? So they're letting Colin present. Are they gaining any light? You know, Colin has continued to recognize these structures of these dates, but they're not putting it on a line. They have no way to know and interpret this information. And Adilio studies, the only reason why people liked it is because it, it fit in with their conspiracy theories. But do they understand the significance of what he presented? No, they don't. The harbor, harbingers, the tokens and the signs, all of these things fit in with all of the light that God has given us. But they wouldn't know that because they're not studying it. So if you refuse to study and receive light, you're just as responsible as if you rejected it with full knowledge, correct? The things that you might have known, even though you didn't know them, but you might have known, but you rejected to look and examine that light, you're still responsible. You can't say, well, I didn't know. Because... You had the opportunity to know. And the reason you didn't want to know had to do with your own character, nothing to do with somebody else's character, right? You can't blame somebody else's character for you not knowing. Because if we have a Christ-like character, we're going to examine light no matter where it comes from, no matter how much that person annoys us no matter how much we don't like the sound of their voice, no matter how much we don't like their mannerisms. If light comes, we have to accept it, no matter how humble the instrument. And God has given light to all kinds of people in this movement. And we have to examine it. And if it's light, we need to accept it. But if we don't examine it, we're still, we're still held responsible. <clears throat> So now we can say that we can take Jotham's line and we can see that the first message has to do with the 264 symbol, 26 day of the fourth month. And now we have the second angel arrive. And the second angel arrive has to do with Ezekiel. Now, with Ezekiel, we have there the 391.5, but we have we have the two Josiahs. That is, we have the prophecy of Josiah, and we have the prophecy of Josiah Lynch. Those two come together on July 16th, 2016, the one-year anniversary from the release of Ellen White's writings. We have this providential presentation at the School of the Prophets, which is on the Sabbath. Normally, it'd be at Lambert Church, but a storm is the only reason that I ended up presenting on that day. I, I wouldn't have done any more sermons at the School of the Prophets that year. Well, I guess until camp meeting. 
so at camp meeting, I'm going to present it again. But I first presented there at, at the School of the Prophets instead of Lambert Church. So they have the church at, at the school rather than at Lambert because of the power being out at Lambert for a couple of weeks. Right? <clears throat> so, so it's the 391.5 that's going to be presented. Ezekiel and Revelation 9. Josiah Lich's prophecy and the prophecy of Josiah, which Jeff recognizes the significance of this, that this is something that has never been understood. And he's known that it's been studied and studied and studied. And he recognizes it's the correct interpretation of Ezekiel 4, verse 4 to 6. So we now have some, some this light. And Jeff says, more light is going to come from Ezekiel to this movement. So then in 2017, we have the symbol of July 18th. Now, it occurs on the day of the Revelation 12 sign prophecy. So it's that failed prediction of the Protestants. But we have another symbol, 391.5. And then we have the 187. So that's going to be a formalization of the message. Now, what I'm doing is I'm using Samuel Snow's letters here, right? So this is really Snow's letters. And particularly the last letter, July 18th. So, so we have this July 18th symbol as a symbol of the PBM. That's, that's what's happening there. So then in uh, 2018, so again, Heidi and I, are invited uh, to come to Arkansas. And in God's providence, I'm able to go there. There's a long story of how that actually comes about, that Heidi and I are able to be there. And it's definitely providential that we're there. Right? So it's not something that we planned. We're going to be there. And, um, you know, I start presentations in dealing with um, <clears throat> uh, my presentations there are going to be dealing with the week of Christ study. I'm going to be speaking at the camp meeting um, starting on October 16th, I believe it is, the camp meeting starts. So I, I can't remember if I start presenting on the 17th, but, but this is all planned out. But before that happens, you know, Tess is going to <clears throat> present uh, Two presentations on October 3rd, 10 Days, and The Midnight Cry. Those two presentations are going to bring to light this November 9th, 2019 date. And 10 days later, The Midnight Cry is given. Uh, we're going to have uh, Daniel from Brazil presenting at Lambert Church. And at noon, I do this calculation that 391 and a half days from noon, October 13th, to midnight commencing November 9th, 2019. This is three, 391.5 days. Is part of this structure because he makes this prediction regarding 126 days from the camp meeting in Italy, right? So he's going to count from June 10th as the first day and he's counting 126th day is October 13th. And there's a whole structure and that whole structure is Samuel Snow's letters. So you can see that Snow's letters are here, but this is also Snow's letters. So that, that's an empowerment of Snow's letters. So Snow's letters, the prediction before midnight, is a formalization. And here Snow's letters are used, or are going to be seen, that the structure of Snow's letters are going to be seen with this uh, Prediction. So even though we're going October 13th, 2018, as the start of this, we say it goes to September 7th, 2019. So in that period of time, uh, we have Snow's letters. We then, the two 9-11 prayers, 
of, of Jeff are going to be recognized in their structure and, and how that fits in with this whole structure of Snow's letters. And then we're going to have um, <clears throat> the understanding of July 18th is going to be brought out. It's going to be rejected by the movement, even though Jeff initially accepts it. And then when we get to September 7th, 2019, Jeff is, so there's lots that happens. We can actually create an entire line if we wanted to look at the second angel empowered. And that entire line uh, is that Levitical chiasm, right? So that Levitical chiasm is all tied up in that one way mark, 2018. Now it's gonna be, of course, connected to November 9th, because that's part of the Levitical chiasm, but it's that date there, or that way mark there, the second angel empowered, that is uh, important. Now we put Judges 9.17 because of September 7th, 2019, so, or Judges 9.7, right, because of September 7th, 2019. And this is going to be 329 days, right, so that's going to relate to the 3,291 days of this structure, right? So that's that structure. <clears throat> okay, so um, so now we get to November 9th, 2019. The 273 is going to be presented. That's the arrival of the third angel. Brother Theodore. Yep. You, you, um, you presented in uh, October 2016, right? October 2016, what? That's I when you presented, right? Yeah, I present again in 2016. I present uh, the structure. That's, October. That's in October, right? I got yeah, it here. That's, I got it here on the notes, but it don't give no dates. Yeah, it's going to be... Um, uh, I can tell you in 2016, at least if I can remember correctly, um, um, I think it's going to be from the 9th to the camp meeting goes from the 9th to the 15th. Um, because at that, that camp meeting, I remember I had a toothache and I had to get a tooth pulled. So, yeah, you had to get your tooth pulled. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I know I was supposed to present on the 13th, which is the Thursday. That was supposed to be my last presentation. Uh, but because I had got my tooth pulled the day before, or something like that, I ended up presenting on uh, the 14th. Uh, which was the Friday, uh, but that recording did not get saved. Uh, there was a fault with the, the the hard drive, and so I presented it my last presentation on the sixteenth. Um, and I know, uh, so I think I presented the eleventh, the twelfth. I was supposed to present on the thirteenth. Instead, it was moved to the fourteenth. And then the one recorded on the 14th wasn't saved. So I presented the third message on the 16th Sunday morning with hardly anyone there. There's just a few people there. So, so there was three presentations that I did in October. So I'm pretty sure those are the dates. All right. I just looking at the notes. That's the reason I, I got the notes. That's the reason I asked. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Now, um, so in 2016, it's going to be these two Josiahs that are connected. Now, you know, again, putting these these dates down, what what we have is, um, you know, we have nine verse six. So if we take Judges nine verse six, oh, you can't capitalize numbers. Um, nine verse six. And 9 verse 6 is going to apply to here, but then we have ju Judges 9, 7 here. So we, we don't have a verse for um, that way mark. But I think what we can do is we can put Judges uh, 
nine six and nine seven, we can just say that this is all part of this line. So there's not a need to put anything at this way mark, right? We can say this is also uh, nine verse six. Oops, I did it again. Nine verse six. So we're just going to use that same verse for both of those way marks for the arrival and the formal formalization. <clears throat> okay, so, but really these verses are all just relating to this history. Now, when we get to uh, November 19th, we would take then um, 9 verse 7, keep capitalizing numbers. 9 verse 7 to, um, and then what verse is that? Uh, 13. And that's just, it's not going to include the bramble, it's just going to include the vine. So and we're just putting all those together here. So that's the third angel arriving, but it's going to be fleshed out in Abimelech's downfall, right? So in Abimelech's downfall, you're going to have this history being this first message. So this is going to go back to November 9 as being the olive because we're going to take each of these, um, these symbols here. But we're also going to have 831 as the time of the end. So that might seem kind of... Uh, odd, I guess, that we're going to do it that way. Now, the thing that's interesting is 831 is August 31. And we know here in this one, we're going to have 831. And that's going to tie to this August 31 symbol, right? So so these these the, you can put these on top of each other. Right? So you can take both of these lines and place them on top of each other. But we're placing them, uh, you know, one after the other here. So we got uh, the olive, the fig, and the bramble. And we're saying that the olive is from September 7th to November 9th. Right? So we're saying that's 9, 7 to 11, 9. And then the fig is from 11, 9 to July 18th. And then the vine is from July 18th to December 25th. And then the brambles January 11th, right? <clears throat> so does this make much more sense than it did the last few days? Last couple of days. Is it? Coming together in people's minds. Yeah or nay. <clears throat> you can just put it in the chat. You don't have to say it out loud. So is there people who who don't understand this? Okay, so Dwight says beginning to be more clear, right? Um Hopefully, it is more clear for everyone. Um, it's definitely clear to me. Now, as I'm writing my my notes for the camp meeting, um, you know what I'm realizing that that we're presenting to this movement for them to examine, for us to examine, is the history of this movement, how God has led this movement. Right, because God has led this movement all through this history. Now, the light that's come to this movement hasn't always come from Jeff. Now, initially, in you know, prior to 9-11, that light is coming from Jeff. Jeff is primarily, I mean, he's reading other people's materials, he's answering letters. But for the for the most part, the light has come from Jeff. When we get to 9-11. A change happens in the movement. We start to have other people 
presenting ideas in the movement that Jeff then accepts. The understanding of 9-11, for instance, isn't something that Jeff came up with. It was Brother Williams, right? So, um, and, and then we're going to see the movement start to rapidly uh, develop after 2010. After 2010, uh, when we start to get uh, conflicts occurring within the movement in 2010, that become major conflicts. Um, a lot of light is starting to develop. So William says, yes, it is getting clear. Um, so we start to, to see all this light. And this light is coming from all quarters, right? Uh, we're going to find, you know, light's going to be coming from Africa. We're going to have blessings. We're going to have uh, light coming from, from uh, England, right, from the UK, right? Light coming just from all over the place. Light coming from Canada, right? And and all of this light comes together. Jeff becomes sort of the the focal point, right? To bring all this light together into focus uh, for this movement. And the school of the prophets is developed, and 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 that helps lots of things. We have students going there uh, to get training, and and this helps in the movement. But this movement starts to grow beyond anything that it had been before. And, and really, I would think the height of that um, was the camp meeting in 2016. So in the fall, that's going to be the height of the growth of this movement. But things are going to happen within the movement that, I mean, the movement could have done amazing things if it had... Um, those that were leading out, if they had a Christ-like spirit. But instead, there was a, a spirit of envy and, and a desire to control what was happening. And Heidi and I witnessed that uh, and how other people were treated at that camp meeting. Um, and, and so we saw this just worked out from 2016, 2017, 2018. Uh, and then finally, it culminates in 2019 with Parminder's movement, uh, the Omega movement leaving uh, this message. So we need to understand our history because connected to that history is all of this light that God has given us. So, so that's where we're going to leave it today. We're quitting a bit early, but Heidi and I have to leave right away. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to close with prayer. So let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study and uh, for each person and their involvement. We just ask that you can continue to teach us, lead and guide us. And uh, thank you for uh, bringing these things much clearer to our minds than they have been. May your angels watch over us and protect us and may you uh, bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.